Hey everyone, how's it going? Travis and Susie here from the Wolf Hunters. Travis and Susie. And we got a reaction video for you. It's a reaction. We got this link right here. You can find that link in the description box below. If you'd like to request your own personal reaction video, you click it and pick it. You can request music or movie scenes, comedy skits, and live performances. All that good stuff. Today's Did you see what random Afghan veteran is bringing us today? Jarrell, Texas, F5 Tornado. Oh my gosh. And Random Afghan veteran says, Hey Travis, hey Susie. I realize that we've done quite a few tornado videos, but all of them are F3 to F4 strength. Wow. To F4 strength. Even that El Reno tornado was only classified. What? what? Oh yeah, because it has to do with damage, right? That's what we learned. Oh, really? It's not. From what I've heard. Okay, I'm new to this. Uh, wait. Let's see if it, if he mentions just, it. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll just read this. Uh, El Reno Tornado was only classified in F3. And I saw a lot of comments saying, do Joplin F5 or more F5. But I wanted to go with something a little different. I'll warn you now, though, there isn't an F5 that isn't sad in some way uh, due to having caused catastrophic damage to get that rating. Oh, okay. So please be ready for that. Please enjoy. So I thought, I was under the impression that it had to do with um, May the amount of wind speeds, but... Now that I think about it, that might be hurricanes that are like, oh, if it if it has this amount of wind speeds for this long, this consistently, then it's cat, uh, then it can be um, a category whatever hurricane. So now I, I don't I'm not sure. We're gonna see if. What is the criteria for an F5 tornado? Oh, wind speeds of 261 to 318 miles per hour is the old scale. While the new scale lists an EF5 as a tornado with winds above 200 miles per oh, hour okay. and found to be sufficient to cause the damage previously ascribed to the F5 range of wind speeds. Got it. Dang. So that is what it is. Forget anything I said. What determines the... <laughs> I like this question, though. What determines the F of a tornado? <sighs> Wind speeds and, and related, related damage. damage. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, so it seems like it would probably be hard to rate it until it's done, until it's gone. Yeah. Or while it's in the midst. Like with hurricanes... As you see them coming, they have a category. You're like, oh, it's now at a category this because it's like the amount of sustained winds. That's what it's called. If the mm. sustained mile per hour of wind is for a certain amount of time, it can be a different category. Mm. But this has to be after it's over because tornado is so quick and wild. Dang. Hit the like button, subscribe. Now this, this title says the worst S. The worst F5 in history. Yikes. That makes me scared. Yes. Because with natural disasters, sometimes there's, you know, fatalities. And that is, yeah. uh, I can't imagine that. Yeah. That's very sad. Yes. Speaking of which, warning. Okay. Warning. Um, when you're being filmed, okay, and there's something sad and you feel like crying, it's very uncomfortable. Can be. Yes. It can be very uncomfortable. So when I know I'm going to cry, it kind of starts with a laugh and then turns into crying. So I'm not laughing at any damage. We have any... gotten in trouble for this in the past. I'm not laughing at any anything. Uh, sympathy goes out to um, those that have taken any kind of loss, whether it's life or, you know, housing or anything. Yeah, we like have that. uh we actually have lost our house in a yeah. mudslide and yeah. uh it, a long time ago. Yeah. Um and, you know, the 
the pain that comes with even just all of a sudden having a home, yeah. um, you know, is, is wild. So yeah. no, that's crazy. Or your business or something. It's crazy. May 27th, 1997. A tornado was photographed in the high plains of Gerald, wow. Texas. 23 seconds later, another photo. And a couple minutes later, another. What the photographer didn't know was in just eight minutes, 27 lives would disappear. Literally. In the days leading up to the ominous tornado photo, forecasts being issued for areas around Gerald, Texas, highlighted a high likelihood of thunderstorms and a possibility of a couple of tornadoes. This prompted the SPC, or the Storm Prediction Center, to release a moderate risk for the local area. But this moderate. weather pattern near Texas was not really concerning, and it's honestly pretty usual for the area. By May 27th, the residents of Gerald are greeted by tranquil blue skies. Wait, so that yellow, that is... Uh... Moderate? For tornadoes, that's the... Just the weather, yeah. I, oh, okay. I guess, yeah. And it's honestly pretty usual for the area. By May 27th, the residents of Gerald are greeted by tranquil blue skies. For many residents of the town, poor weather was hardly evident, let alone the risk of tornadoes. But by noon, the predicted storms began to pop up to the northeast. Although the storms were very strong, the risk of tornadoes was still expected to be relatively small. But unbeknownst to both meteorologists and residents, subtle yet concerning fluctuations began to occur in the atmosphere around the storms. While small and difficult to notice, these fluctuations should be insignificant, wow, so but with smart. a perfect mix of ingredients, they can cause huge problems. Suddenly, a deadly scenario begins to reveal itself. A single storm quickly becomes dominant just to Gerald's northeast, near Waco, Texas, and it begins to move towards the southwest. This is the opposite direction of how a typical right. thunderstorm would travel, which placed wow. the otherwise unthreatened residents of Gerald and surrounding areas in the firing line of a rapidly intensifying storm. At 1 p.m. CDT, a frontal cloud appears from the sky, and soon enough, a full tornado dropped down near Moody, Texas. The tornado meandered around a mobile home before destroying it and then immediately dissipating. This odd tornadic behavior would certainly not be a first wow. on this day. Another tornado drops down from the supercell, and then another, and another, and another. All beautiful and all incredibly weak. By 3 o'clock p.m., the storm is only five miles northeast of Gerald and is drawing closer. It is now when the odd weather conditions start to display, as in an instant, a needle-like tornado reaches down from the storm clouds. Although rather small, its size is deceitful. Within the narrow funnel, winds are already very intense. Any hay bales or trees unfortunate enough to be struck are shredded instantly. This shredding of anything it could touch shrouded the base of the funnel in dust. As it passes less than a thousand yards near the small community of Prairiedale, a farmstead is struck. The tornado is now even more dangerous as it's shrouded in sharp metal and splintered wood. But just as it seemed the tornado was intensifying, it suddenly weakened. The residents of Gerald took a sigh of relief believing they had just narrowly avoided disaster. But little do they know, Mother Nature is playing a cruel- What's wild to me is, so I know that like, when people live in different parts of the United States of America, that funnel clouds can be somewhat, I guess, normal? I don't know. But like, people driving past this and not being like, horrified, like- is wild to me because I've never seen this in real life. I've never oh, seen yeah. mm -hmm. a funnel in real life. I I know I drove past a tornado before, but I didn't see it. So like this to me is just crazy. What's mind blowing to me is like the shape of it and how like precise and like like perfectly it's formed. It's like a uh, versus it's not like it's not like messy. Like it's just like. Whoa. It's like tight. Yeah, this one particularly. Yeah. It's like uh, when it's like like when you take a magnifying glass of the sun, and like it pinpoints the the heat. Yeah. That's like I feel like what's happening here. It's hmm. crazy. It suddenly weakened. The residents of Gerald took a sigh of relief, believing they had just narrowly avoided disaster. But little do they know, Mother Nature is playing a cruel trick. In less than a minute, a stronger dust cloud swirls up from the ground. A large, cone-shaped funnel begins to descend from the sky. Within the swirling chaos, a strange phenomenon is spotted. Several different funnels begin to appear, forming the distinct look of a multi-vortex tornado, a unique and intense type of tornado. Scott Beckwith, is working at Gerald Farm Supply when over the business's weather radio, he hears word of a tornado in Gerald. Stepping outside, he rounds the building to the east end, where he quickly spots the massive snake slithering in the sky. In a rush, 
He runs back in and grabs his camera, taking pictures of what he's seeing. The first image looks straight out of a movie, and the ones following show a gorgeous twister dancing around in the sky. A brief gap occurs in the images until the next one is taken, but this one showed something much more sinister. What was initially a small rope tornado has now formed into a messy and large vortex with copious amounts of dust spraying outwards. In the next image, the tornado appears to grow even larger, and as the tornado progresses and the debris cloud briefly disappears, the beast emerges. The next image, however, would be one of the most infamous images ever taken of a tornado. The tangle of vortices- It's interesting how he mentions how it's gorgeous. Because there's this weird thing with nature where there is a level of like, wow, that is a spectacular thing. But then simultaneously, it's extremely it's terrifying. Disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of like a weird. It looks like it has legs. Like it looks like it's just walking along. Yeah. See is from the intensifying tornado. Paint the picture of legs in motion as if the tornado is walking. This type of image Whoa. dates back centuries to ancient urban legend and is called a dead man walking tornado. Not only is this a terrifying description, but it would morbidly allude to what was about to occur. In mere minutes, the tornado would practically walk into Cheryl. Almost immediately, as the dead man walking image is taken, the tornado begins to tear up the ground. In a cotton field, 18 inches of soil is scoured away exposing the bedrock. This ground scouring is showing that in some strange evolution, the tornado has now become incredibly strong and violent. In a different field, a herd of cows are caught in the tornado. Cotton plants ripped up by the tornado now contribute to a sandblasting effect where anything or anyone caught in the tornado will suffer bits of vegetation and dirt rapidly scoring oh. against it like sandpaper. The cows in this field subjected to the force are reportedly oh, skinned by the wind and debris, out. in oh. some cases down to the bone. If this could happen to a cow, imagine what would happen oh. to a human in these winds. During this initial display That's of power, the first home is hit and reduced to pieces. Here, the storm shelter of the property has its five inch thick concrete roof torn off and it's never found again. Fortunately, no one was home at the time. The tornado then moves onward towards a farmstead on County Road 308, obliterating all structures located there, including a barn, multiple grain silos, and a home. Luckily, no fatalities or injuries were reported here, suggesting no one was home at this property either. With all the thick soil being gouged out of the ground, the tornado quickly gains an oh. ominous oh black gosh. color. The funnel grows steadily, swallowing up an increasing it vast area of land. It isn't funnel. long until the tornado is approaching three quarters of a mile in width and is now crossing into a subdivision named Double Creek Estates. Oh my Sirens have been blaring oh no. for over 10 minutes, allowing the residents to find appropriate shelter. Five members of the Igo family arrive home to take shelter as the tornado oh. is only minutes away. At this point, the tornado appears less like a <gasps> conventional funnel and more like a monstrous fist dragging itself across the ground directly towards the subdivision. Their last view it's before they huge. slam their door is the rolling cloud of debris beginning to consume the nearby recycling plant. As the Igo family- Oh my gosh, hold on a second. Look at this. <gasps> what do you do? You can't do anything. Oh you can't- Oh my gosh. You could didn't you know. You didn't know it was coming. Oh like- no, Could you imagine being in the car and looking to no. your left and there's this monster. Everyone in those cars is screaming. Oh I my would, gosh. wouldn't you? Yeah, holy Oh smokes. my God, maybe- praying or something that is towards the subdivision Terrible. their last view before they slam their door is the rolling cloud of debris beginning to consume the nearby recycling plant as the Igo family hurries into the central room of their home, the most appropriate shelter at their disposal, they can only pray it is enough to protect them from the worsening conditions outside. Meanwhile, at the recycling plant, all hell is being let loose. Steel beams are warped and snapped. Nearby roads are subjected to such extreme winds. Over 500 feet of asphalt is stripped away what? as the forward movement of the tornado what? begins to slow. I did not even know that was possible. I did not know that was possible. Well, I mean, the soil came up and you can see the bedrock. This oh, is crazy. This is crazy. Low, the cloud of steel and mud begins to envelop oh. the Igos. The sandblasting effect of the winds smashes in their windows and allows the torrent of air to begin tearing apart the structure. Oh, in an extremely maybe. horrifying turn of events, the tornado begins to slow down until it's practically stationary oh, over the home. Gosh. But it doesn't weaken, allowing the strongest winds to pound and tear their home minute upon minute. The effect is much the same as a huge power washer, scouring the paint from their car before crushing and mangling it to the point where you can't even tell it's a car, and disassembling the home's walls before reducing the bricks to basically dust. It is minutes before the winds subside, but no mercy is ever given to the Igo family. 
as all five do not survive. The tornado slowly crawls forward, no faster than a walking pace, towards its next target, the Mowring household. John and Michael Ruiz, realizing their trailer home will offer no safety from the approaching winds, rush to the neighboring Mowring family to shelter with them. Lacking an underground shelter, they quickly head to the most interior room of the well-built brick home. But tragically, much like the Igo family, the tornado shows no mercy. Within seconds, the walls cave in upon the six victims, pinning them as pieces of rebar, grass, and wood rain down on them. Before long, the debris itself is bombarded with such ferocity that no large objects even remain. Within the chaos, all six individuals are killed and left buried in a pile of basically brick and wood powder. To the north and south of the same road, the tragedy continued. To the south, Cindy Smith and her two daughters perish as the home they are sheltering in is lifted into the air by the tornado. The home was obliterated so significantly, no discernible debris remains in the area. Simultaneously to the north, the LaFrance family is sheltering in their bathroom as their roof is ejected into the sky. The father, Billy, feels the winds beginning to tug on him, causing him to grasp to the sides of the bathtub in an attempt to continue shielding his daughter and his wife Debbie. The last thing Debbie sees before the house crumbles onto her is her husband slipping away into the darkness. As the bathtub becomes mobile, she embraces her daughter in an attempt to save her, but quickly loses consciousness. Because there are nearly no storm shelters in the Double Creek subdivision, these families had no other choice than to try and survive the storm above ground. However, a select few have the fortune of a storm cellar on their property. Six members of the Hernandez family seek refuge in their storm cellar as their home is swept away above them, whilst those seeking above ground shelter in the neighboring home do not survive. At a different storm shelter, Michael Vrana, along with 18 other people, sit cramped and in fear as the winds howl above them. Many fear the cellar door will be torn off as the roar of the winds climb and climb. Thankfully, the tornado passes by without incident, and everyone in the shelter survives without a scratch. Without these two storm cellars in Double Creek. Do they have like community shelters? Like there's 18 people shoved in that shel shelter. Uh, I don't know if they're neighbors or whatever, but yeah. you know, when you I feel like there should be like per neighborhood, like one massive one. But I feel like they you like, where do you like, you have no time. Like you've, these people are lucky they made it to a shelter at all. Oh my gosh. There's no doubt that many more people would have died. Although no more than 25 structures are impacted in Double Creek, a total of 27 people are left dead by the time the vortex leaves the community. The damage at directly impacted homes is incredible. Even among the most powerful tornadoes, debris from the destroyed homes indicates to an observer that there was once a structure located there. In Double Creek Estates, this is not the case. To someone viewing the aftermath, most would assume the area was never developed in the first place. Where homes once stood, only bare foundation slabs remain. Not even the plumbing is spared, as in many cases, it has been ripped up from deep within the concrete and shredded. Although the destruction is clearly attributed to the insane winds, there is no doubt that the slow movement of the tornado was a major factor that allowed the tornado to pulverize the community beyond anything in recorded history. While this could undoubtedly be referred to as the worst tornado damage to have ever been inflicted, it arguably isn't even the strongest tornado. But after the tornado finishes its rampage through Double Creek, the time it has before it dies is limited. It meanders to the west towards an unpopulated forest before slowly shriveling up and dissipating. But even before the tornado is gone, first responders and EMT crews are rushing to the hellish scene to help survivors. When they enter Double Creek, they discover that there's little hope that anyone in the path is alive. In the core of the damaged path, it is found that the survival rate above ground was 0%. First responders are joined by civilian volunteers and what is now victim recovery. At first, the search didn't find anyone. It isn't until closer inspection, the remains of the victims are identified. The identities of the deceased can only be found through use of dental records. As a seemingly futile search for survivors continues, the unbelievable occurs. By a peach tree just north of the core of the damage, Debbie LaFrance is found badly injured, but still alive. To this day, she maintains that if this tree, located in her backyard, wasn't there, she surely would have died. But the miracle continues, as just down the road, her daughter is also found injured, but alive, sitting on the ground oh. hundreds of feet from where her home once stood. Unfortunately, Billy, who protected Debbie and his daughter in their bathtub, did not survive. In the years following the tornado, Double Creek Estates would rebuild, but a large void had been left in the tornado's wake. Three entire families had been killed, as well as 13 children. In memory of the victims of May 27, 1997, oh the Gerald Memorial Park was established and funded by relatives of the Igo family. The park itself resides on the former site of the Igo family home. 27 trees that line the entrance represent the 27 victims that died that day. 
Ugh. Whew. Yeah. <sighs> that is wild. Is that so? Um, I'm not sure when the um, movie Twister came out, but in that movie, there's a mom and a dad and a daughter, and the dad is shielding the family. Oh, uh, come on. You got Did they, like, was that, I don't know. Anyway, that is just. It's really painful. Oh my gosh, when I think of, like. That you can't do anything. Uh, like, I, like it's hard parent? as a parent because you're like, your one job is to do this thing to keep your kids safe. And like, to know that there was nothing that they could do while their kids are looking at them. You know what I mean? Like, that is just, that's heart wrenching. And you want to, like, be like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And, like, you just don't know if it's going to be okay. Stop. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't do this. Okay. We're going to stop the video now. <laughs> I can't handle it. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot wow. to take in. Yeah. All right. Okay, bye, guys. Love you guys.